If you've been looking at multi-scale or so-called fan fretted guitars and thought you'd want to build one, but it seemed awfully complicated, stay with me. I'll show you a simple method to figure it out and it works for all scales. We'll go step by step and in a few minutes you'll know exactly how to do it yourself. So join me, let's slot a multi-scaled fretboard. Hi, I'm Yoav and this is the Electric Luthier. Multi-scaled guitars have become more and more popular and are definitely an eye-catcher. As someone who builds guitars, or a guitar for that matter, this may be a bit intimidating and sure looks complicated at first glance. Considering most hobbyist guitar builders do most of the work manually anyway, the amount of work and complexity it's not that much different. But before we get into the how, we should understand the why. Now those who shouted, because it's cool, have a valid point. And we all know that coolness is sometimes the deciding factor, and not just for guitars. But in fact, the multi-scale guitar, aka fan fret, has two main benefits. The first one is ergonomic. Moving up and down the neck requires some wrist adjustment in order to be able to play and bar properly. If you try and keep your wrist locked and have the motion extend from the shoulder, you'll notice that your index finger points outwards the closer you get to the nut and inwards the closer you get to the body. The fan frets mimic those angles and will allow playing with less strain on the wrist. The second benefit is tonal. Thicker and longer strings sound and intonate better for lower tones. This is the reason why the bass guitar is longer and why a cello or contrabass are even longer with even thicker strings. On the other side of the tonal range, the thinner strings will lend themselves to easier bends with shorter scales, which will require less tension. But how do you measure and how do you decide on which scale length to use? The principle is actually very simple. You pick a longer scale length for the lower E string, I'm talking about standard tuning here, and a short scale for the high E. Most guitars live in the comfort zone between the 24 and 3 quarters Gibson use and the 25.5 inch of typical fenders. The very obvious choice here would take the 25.5 inches or 648 centimeters for the low E, which is typical for fenders, but you can push it a bit more with 26 inches or even 26.5, which is 673 millimeters and is already getting into what is considered baritone territory. This may also require you to use slightly heavier gauge strings, but should definitely give a noticeable difference. For the high E, you can choose the 24 3 quarters scale or even a more moderate 25 inches like the PRS guitars. But again, you can push it towards the 24.5. Of course, the bigger the delta, the more pronounced the look. As far as feel and comfort, it's very subjective. And where moderate fanning of the frets should feel very intuitive, it may start to be uncomfortable at some point. I'm going to try and push it and go with a low 26 inch, which is 660 millimeter scale, and 24.5 or 622 millimeters for the high one. This gives a 1.5 inch or 38 millimeters difference, and it will look awesome. Why? Why the heck not?
<laughs> well, well, what do we need here? We need an neck blank, a good long ruler, a straight edge if your ruler isn't sturdy enough, a short ruler, calipers, and preferably digital, a good sharp pencil, and a sharp blade. Of course, a fretting saw will also be handy. I broke this down so there are 10 simple yet critical steps to get this done right the first time. First, mark the center line, the high E and the low E strings. Two, mark the position of the frets of the longer scale length on the lower E string line. That's 660 millimeters for me. Three, measure again. This one is really if you want to be accurate. This time I measure the delta with the digital calipers and mark with a scalpel on top of the pencil. Four, decide on the neutral fret position and mark the position of the zero fret on the high E string. This is really the trickiest part. Five, starting from there, mark the position of the frets of the shorter scale length on the high E string. Six, again measure the delta with the digital calipers and mark with a scalpel on top of the pencil. Seven, connect the dots and draw the slots with a pencil. Eight, mark the slots with a scalpel. Nine, this is optional, mark the slots a second time with a thicker blade to really make it easy for the slotting saw to stay in its course. Ten and last, cut the slots with a fret saw. All right, enough theory. With all the marking, I prefer a smooth surface, so I'll start with just sanding the fingerboard a bit more. The fingerboards, just like this Indian rosewood, tend to be dark and make marking much harder to see, especially on camera. Well, for your benefit and mine comes the white paint. Yeah, I'm going to be sanding the radius anyway, so why not make our lives easier? A few hours later, this fretboard is not exactly square, so I'm just going to measure the midpoint on either side and make my center line. The scale length should be measured on the line of the string itself and not the edge of the neck, so I'll calculate the 42.2 millimeters at the nut, divided by two, and subtract 3.2 millimeters or 18th of an inch from the edge to get the string position itself. The same for the other edge. At the heel where the 22nd fret would be, it will be 56 millimeters wide, and I'll also again subtract the 3.2 millimeters or 18th of an inch to get the actual string position. I'll have to work out the exact spacing and angles of the rest of the strings when I deal with the nut, but for now, that's all the math I need. The rest will be calculated for me. At this point, you want to have your scale calculator or a table handy. If you want the more standard Fender, Gibson or PRS scales, I will link them below, but you can also install one of the several calculators available for free. So I have my list in front of me and I've taped a ruler to the fretboard. And I'm starting to mark my 660 millimeter scale on the first low E string. I'm going with metric here, so apologies to the Imperial troops. However, the process would be exactly the same. I always measure the offset from the nut first. This way, even if I make a mistake, I'll only affect the one fret and not compound the mistake to all the following ones. Using the second method with a caliper and the delta on the second round 
should help me A, catch any discrepancies of the first measurement, and B, get a more precise location with a digital caliper and the scalpel blade, which is much thinner than the tip of my pencil. We're not gonna be able to get to the 100th of a millimeter, but it'll be close enough. Once both measurements are marked, it's time to decide on where the neutral or straight fret is gonna be. There's no hard fast rule here but it should be somewhere in the middle to not make any of the extremes uncomfortable to play. If you're making the guitar for a specific person, you may want to consider how they hold the guitar, which may change the angle of their hands. A guitar held high like classic Spanish players may require a very different angle than someone who plays it hung down low. After playing around with it, I decide to go with fret number 10. I use a straight angle ruler to mark the position on the high E string, directly opposite the low E. This is my point of reference for this string. When you come to think of it, in theory, this fret doesn't even need to be exactly straight. If you like this type of content, please give a like and subscribe below. And if you want more, you can also check out theelectricluthier.com. Now at this point, I turn back to my scale charts and this time I go to the shorter 622 millimeter. I find the distance to the nut or a zero fret and mark it. Now I just start from here and mark all along the high E string just as I did with the low one. But of course use the shortest scale chart. When I get to the 24th, I'll go back and measure again, but this time with the delta, the calipers and the scalpel. There's no way I'll not find slight differences in the second round, so it's always worth it. I also like to write the fret numbers to stay oriented in the repetitive action. I don't think I can or need to stress the importance of accuracy here. And if you find it tedious, well, I don't know, go build a ukulele. When both sides are marked and scribed with a scalpel, I take the smaller ruler and mark all the frets with a pencil. This is more a visual assurance that we didn't mess it up so far. Everything is still reversible at this point. If it looks good, we're on for scribing with a blade. Remember to align the ruler to the blade marks and not just the pencil. It is important to start with gentle strokes of the blade. The grain will make the blade stray if you use force. We're just trying to mark the position and give the saw an easier path to follow. To make it even easier for the saw blade, I'll repeat the last step with a thicker blade of a box cutter or something like that to slightly deepen and widen the cut. Here again, too much force will make the grain fight against you. We're now in the final stretch and it's time for sewing. Whip out your fret slotting saw and carefully start cutting away. I like to either put a strip of masking tape or draw a line at about four millimeters depth as a visual guide while cutting into the fretboard. Some of these saws come with an adjustable depth stop. To avoid slipping outside the slot, I guide the front side in with my finger and after I've established some grip into the groove, I start working my way into the back as well. I might reverse this and do the back first. After all, we have 25 of these to do. Do try and stay focused and consistent in your motion. This will affect the width and straightness of the slots. This will take the same amount of time as straight slotting, but if you're used to working with a jig, 
this will require a bit more attention. Now once done sawing, you can give it a good sanding to take the paint off or just continue with the radiusing which will do the job as well. Whatever your next step is in the process, you now have a custom-made multi-scaled fingerboard. This whole process is a bit more work than a single-scaled fretboard, but I hope I've made it as clear and simple as possible. I will link the tools I use as well as some scale charts you can download down below. If you want to know where more videos are coming, like and subscribe below and don't forget the little bell to get notified. I also welcome you to visit my website theelectricluthier.com with much more information on guitar building. And until next time, go on, build a guitar!